welcome everyone to today's um, uh, webinar for MedCamp Presents. This is Women and Heart Health. My name is Chantel Gurton and I'm part of the team here at MedCamp that creates content. Today I'm um, really excited to welcome Dr. Beth Abramson. Dr. Beth Abramson is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Toronto, where she is the Paul Albertson Professor in Cardiac Prevention and Women's Health. She's also Director of Cardiac Prevention and Rehabilitation and Women's Cardiovascular Health in the Division of Cardiology at St. Michael's Hospital. Welcome, Dr. Abramson. It's a pleasure to be here. What a good topic and what, a, what an important topic to discuss. It is. So I have a couple of things I just wanted to mention before we um, start. We are going to take questions at the end of the webinar. So throughout the webinar, if something comes to mind, you can use the chat function or the Q&A, and Dr. Abramson will see any of your questions, um, which she'll leave some time at the end for. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was going to just and, uh, say, because I love chatting with clients, patients, the public, but I will give a disclaimer. I cannot, for your health and safety and my own protection, talk about personal health issues. So if you have a story about yourself or a family member and you need advice, I'd ask you to go to your local local expert, um, but we'll try and address the bigger issues uh, in the Q&A. Sounds good. Um, heart health is within the reach of everyone with proper lifestyle choices. However, women are underdiagnosed, undertreated, and understudied when it comes to cardiovascular disease. The facts have triggered a movement. When it comes to heart health, women need to be as well informed and as well cared for as men. During February's Heart Health Month, we've asked a MedCan's cardiologist, Dr. Beth Abramson, to provide female forward recommendations on cardiovascular disease prevention and treatment. And um, this Saturday is Wear Red Canada Day, which is very exciting. It's across Canada. And uh, it's a great chance that you can wear red and you can use these hashtags, Wear Red Canada, Wear Heart Matters. We'll send out an email after the webinar that will give you a link to a whole bunch of events that are happening this um, Saturday across the country in case you wanna join in on them. And you'll be able to see the big nickel in Sudbury lit up or the CN Tower in Toronto if you're in those cities um in celebration and yeah and i think there's education as well so if you go to the links there are programs for the public to raise not just awareness of the issue but to help us understand the issue really important if you've got a friend or family member at risk or living with heart disease thing that's great and one final thing at the end of the webinar we are going to give away a complimentary copy of dr abramson's book heart health for canadians so we'll pick somebody at random so stay right till the very end um, because this is a great book and it's a very generous that we're uh, able to give one away today so let's get started dr abramson um Typically, heart disease is a topic we associate with men's health. And why do you think that that is? Well, um, I know what I know what the issues are. Uh, perception is different than reality, and we're trying to change perception. This is older data, and it still holds true that heart disease and stroke accounts for more deaths and des disability in women than all forms of cancer combined. And you know, they're both leading health threats for our, our patients and for our sisters and our mothers and our aunts and our teachers. Um, but there's a perception out there that that's not the case. And if you ask the average person on the street, people may be misinformed. And women and their friends and family members need to be aware that this is a leading health threat so that we can prevent heart disease and we can be aware of the warning signs and symptoms of heart disease to get the right care that women need. It's been something we've had to deal with for many years, and it is sort of changing, but the, the Go Red for Women wear, uh, campaign that we're involved in is just to continue to raise awareness, because I say that the face of shape disease, the, the face and the shape of heart disease has changed. Heart disease is no longer solely a disease of older white gray-haired men. If you look at the patients I've been taking care of on call for cardiology, they come in all shapes and sizes and colors and sex. And women have heart disease too. 
So let's just advance to this next slide. And this I think is really interesting that the risk increase increases in women after menopause. So can you speak to this? Sure. Coronary heart disease or heart attack, the commonest form of heart disease, um, is associated with risk factors for heart disease. And we're going to talk about that uh, throughout this uh, webinar. And the risk factors for heart disease and then risk of heart disease tends to increase in women at midlife. The average age of men, midlife or menopause is about 51 in women. And after that, women catch up to men, as you can see by the shape of this curve. Women are in gray and men are in black. It is heart disease affects men too, and I'm here to take care of men and women. But with an emphasis on women, women are by and large generally protected from heart attack and stroke and heart disease in general until midlife, after which their risk factors for heart disease and heart disease itself incidence starts to increase. That said, heart disease and stroke can occur in young women. And you can see that in the under 55 age group in, the, uh, in this chart, it is still a, a phenomenon that it occurs. And more recent data suggests that young women are actually develop, are more risk, at risk for developing heart disease. And we can talk about this throughout the webinar. There, webinar, there are some risk factors that take away the premenopausal protection that women uh, that women are afforded, diabetes is a big one. If you have, if you're a young or middle-aged woman with diabetes, your risk for heart disease is much higher. Yeah, and you know we need to make sure that we are uh, eating a healthy life. We're walking the walk and talking the talk. And this has been a really hard year. And this is older data that still holds true. I show this data because it's data from relatively modern times in the province of Ontario where we have access to health care and we see that women as well as men but women actually are not uh, living the life we need them to leave as men as well and I take that first line that looks at physical inactivity so it's you know we're out of shape and these are risk factors for coronary heart disease. And we know that changing these modifiable risk factors have a long and lasting impact. So if you're listening live during, hopefully towards the end, there's a beginning, a middle and an end to everything of this pandemic, or you log on in a year or two to come, I'm hoping that we take the charge of making sure that we are more physically active. And that does not mean you have to put on some spandex and you have to go to a gym. Regular activity, getting out, walking. I have always said that walking is good for the heart. And <laughs> someone called in and said, right now it's minus 40 in Calgary. So you're gonna have to pause for walking outside right now. But in general, when you can get outdoors, when it's safe and not extremely cold, Going for a walk, you know, I, I used to tell people to put on a scarf. Now we can put on a mask to protect ourselves and breathe in less cold air. Um, you know, walking is good for the heart. Going for moderate levels of activity. So you go for a power walk. Make yourself short of breath. Make yourself sweaty. Garden in the summer. You know, we also have been very, very used to in modern society of waiting in our parking lot in the car till we get the spot closest to that store. It's better probably to find a spot furthest away if you have to drive to the store, as society makes us sometimes drive to these big box stores, park and walk further. Because if we change our behaviors and we ingrain physical activity into our lives, women and men will be healthier. We need to eat in a healthy way, fruits and vegetables, and, and work on being overweight, uh, we call it medically obese. Um, I jokingly talk about the Canadian tire. I think many people have gotten a little bit of extra weight across the belly. And that belly fat actually does put us at risk for coronary heart disease. Let me talk about women and men in this regard and shapes of bodies. That sounds silly, but there are certain body shapes that put us at risk for heart attack and stroke. So men, when they gain weight, tend to be more Android or Apple shape. That's what we talk about the belly. Okay, and women when they gain weight when they're younger tend to gain sometimes curvier on their hips like a pear. 
actually a pear shaped weight gain is not as dangerous as the apple weight gain. The problem is you can't be a big pear because it's the actual weight across the waist that actually makes a difference. And as women go through midlife or menopause, their body fat composition and shape changes. So in the women who are older, who go through midlife, that pear shape that tends to be not as harmful for heart disease can go into the apple shape or male distribution of fat intake. And it's that dangerous fat we can talk about that puts us at risk for heart attack and stroke. And you know, there are a lot of vibrant, healthy, older women out there who are not very, very overweight. And um, you know, you don't have to run a marathon to be physically active and fit. And I'm encouraging women and their, and their, and their, uh, their loved ones to do so. That's really, I mean, that's inspiring to so, you know, to take better care. So um, let's just move into what we sort of talked about at the beginning, which is that it said that women are underdiagnosed, undertreated, and understudied. So can we examine each one of those in turn, perhaps? So why women are underdiagnosed? So that's a complicated question with a complicated answer. Women sometimes present slightly differently than men with various chest pain presentations, but they may not present to the emergency room because they don't think they could be at risk for heart disease, right? Um, I give a very uh, common analogy and story of patients in my own practice. You know, I have the woman who was in her 40s who had a heaviness elephant on her breath, on her chest, was sweaty and short of breath, and rolls over to her husband in the middle of the night and says, Something's wrong. He says, You know what? We're calling 911. And she was brought in with a heart attack, diagnosed, and got the best care possible. I have another woman who was in my practice in her 60s, actually a socialite who was uh, giving back with charities, had a charity ball she was organizing. This woman, this is story is a few years old. I'm not giving away names of these patients, but it talks about what people, how they perceive their symptoms. This woman was unwell. It was the day of the event that she had been planning for six months. She was nauseous, a little chest discomfort. She looked gray. She wasn't feeling well. She decided not to go to the hospital. She actually didn't even go to her event because she was so unwell um, and then held off for a few days before she bothered to see a doctor where clearly she was that unwell, there was something going on. And those symptoms, had she come to hospital, she would have likely been diagnosed with a heart attack and she presented later to her doctor. So we as women and as friends and family members of women need to be aware it could be your heart, seek medical attention. So that's part of it. The other part is that sometimes our presentations are slightly different, not extremely different. Women still present with a heart attack. The most common presentation is a chest discomfort in their throat, chest discomfort. It can go into their throat, arm or jaw. And we need to be aware of warning signs and symptoms of heart attack for both sexes. If you're short of breath, you're sweaty, especially nowadays where people are afraid to come to the hospital, it's actually safer to go to the hospital and get it checked out than avoid the hospital. So the underdiagnosis is a bit on the medical side and a bit on the, on the patient or client side where we have to say, hey, it could be my heart. I need to get it checked out. I've been a big advocate of making sure people know which questions to ask. I don't expect you to know the answers. I went to school for a long time. I'm still learning to know how to address these, these answers. But I will say that if you know what the question is, what treatment should I be getting? Do I need another test? Those Could it be my heart? Asking those questions will get your doctors. And we've got some pretty good healthcare providers out there um, on the right path. So that's the underdiagnosis. The undertreatment uh, is an interesting one. We've seen care gaps close over the years, but we are still seeing gaps in care with actually regional variability. So if someone walked into my hospital. I was just on call for cardiology last week. Um, I'm sitting here in the hospital now without my mask on because I'm in my own room. Um, but um, the care that that person would have gotten, regardless of their sex, male or female, regardless of whether they were an executive on Bay Street or someone who was at risk in inner city, was hopefully and likely the same care and data suggests that. But if you're living in a smaller rural setting with less access to health care, there may be more variability in care and actually um, getting the right care may be different for women and men. So we do see regional vari er, variation in Canada 
and internationally. So that, that, that's a problem as well. And so we were talking about treatment. We, we need to make sure we're treating women with evidence-based medications and treatments and so that women are studied in clinical trials. Most of the um, treatments and drugs I prescribe my female patients have been proven effective in women. There are actually less women in the studies and we need to address that, but it's still been proven effective in women. So we need to make sure that women uh, and their family members and friends are out there volunteering and saying, yes, hey, I'm happy to partic participate in a study. And you know, there are various reasons why, why that occurs. And some of this is how we are, are socialized and as women and men, we have to address. Mm -hmm. You sort of touched on the um, women are understudied. Um, I guess before we move on, is there anything else about that? Like what implications that has? I mean, I guess that's obvious You, for, in some ways if there, are, but is there things that, that would be different if, if more women were studied? Yeah, I think, you know, in clinical science, we base our decisions, hopefully in an informed, we call it evidence-based. So patients are in studies and we want women in studies to prove it's effective. And women may be different than men. I am, you can't see on the Zoom call, but I'm not that tall and I'm not that big. And the shape of my artery, the size of my arteries and my heart is smaller than my six foot four colleague. And so we need to make sure treatments dosing of medications, interventions are effective and at the right dose for women. And, and there's no doubt that in cardiology, we've seen over the years that we've had to dose adjust based on body size. Um, and we need to prove that. So I, I, I think that um, we would have better care for women and for men if we looked at the populations who are affected by the disease and really try and individualize. You know, we are going towards personalized medicine uh, in the next uh, in the next few decades we're getting there but part of that personalization has a focus on our sex our biology am i an xx or an xy chromosome person and then our gender society and social and how does society affects us if i am the caregiver in my family am i taking the time for myself and that can be a female or a male trait. And so we need to look at sex and gender in medicine in general. Oh, that's so interesting. Um, so that leads into our next question, which is in what ways does heart disease affect women differently than men? And what are some of the contributing factors that might increase your chance of heart disease? Okay, so traditional risk factors for heart disease, uh, common in both women and men, include high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, diabetes, and an early family history of heart disease. And let me clarify a family history. Family history is a close relative. We call it a first degree relative, a parent or a sibling, or heaven forbid, a child with early heart disease. And it doesn't matter if you're the sex of that relative. So if you're a woman listening in who had a father who had a heart attack in his 50s, your risk for heart disease genetically is higher than the average woman at your age and stage. The same holds true if you're a man with a mother who had heart disease in their 50s or 60s. Notice I added a little bit of age to the woman. It's because, I, as I mentioned earlier, women are somewhat protected until midlife or menopause from coronary heart disease. We know there are emerging gender-specific risk factors for heart disease as well. And there's increasing evidence that women who have diabetes or high blood pressure with their pregnancies actually are at risk for cardiovascular disease earlier on in life than we used to think. So if you go back and we tended not to ask this question, we don't ask this question enough in medicine. A conversation with a family doctor or a specialist if you're coming with symptoms could include for a woman who's at midlife, during your pregnancies, if you were pregnant, did you have high blood pressure or diabetes? Because we know your risk for cardiovascular disease is higher in the long run. I also mentioned that women who have diabetes before midlife or menopause absolutely are at higher risk for cardiovascular disease. The other issue is our, hormon our, our hormonal status and menopause. You know, menopause is a stage of life. It is not a disease, but it is something that affects uh, our bodies. And so estrogen levels fall during midlife or menopause and estrogen to testosterone ratios change. Sometimes women have symptoms of menopause and we need to give women back 
hormone therapy for severe symptoms of menopause, but it's not recommended as a preventive therapy. Having said that, the average age of menopause is about 50, 51. If you're a young woman who goes through premature or early menopause in your 30s, it is recommended for your heart and blood vessels, as well as your bones and the rest of your body, that women are replaced, all else being equal, until midlife. So premature menopause is actually a risk factor for cardiovascular disease or heart attack and stroke. And when I see a woman in my office and I want to say, I can do this over the phone now because right now I'm doing virtual consults sometimes and I don't actually see a person. I don't want to insult them. I say, you look young, but on the inside, because you're, you, you went through uh, menopause in your 30s, you're actually 10 to 15 years older on the inside. And we need to think about that as we address your risk. So there are some emerging sex specific risk factors that are unique to women that will require ongoing evaluation and research. Um, so in speaking about menopause, so is, does it have to do more with like age? So if you had menopause at a, a typical age, whether that's in your fifties or sixties versus younger, does that affect it because it's menopause or does that just affect it? Is it something to do with the age and menopause as well? Is so, there... okay. So after menopause, a woman's risk for cardiovascular disease increases. So if you go through an earlier age of menopause, your risk increases earlier on. Okay. So if you are a woman who's in their 50s, whose menstrual cycle ended uh, 20 years ago, on the inside, you're actually older than the average 50 year old. But uh, it is a time when a woman's risk for high blood pressure, diabetes and high cholesterol start to increase. So if there are women at midlife and beyond listening today or friends and family members, that is a very good opportunity for women to go and talk to their primary care providers about getting their risk assessed. Check the blood pressure, check the cholesterol, talk about activity, talk about your shape and size. Let's work on making ourselves healthier and, and slightly leaner because we're all, most people in society are a little bit overweight and a little bit out of shape and sort of worse nowadays. And I don't want people to feel bad about it. It's never too late or too early to make a lifestyle change. But these lifestyle changes are sometimes hard. I think it's harder for my patients to make lifestyle changes in all of us in general than just sometimes to take a pill. They're tremendously important though. So let's talk about prevention and um, starting to think about your heart health. So maybe we can break it down by age, say what we can do in our 30s, 40s, 50s. And, um, and you sort of already alluded to that lifestyle is, is just as important as diet as medication. <laughs> Yeah. So in preventing heart disease, we want to start off and, and we can start these good habits at any age, but it's good to start thinking about this, even in your 30s, incorporating physical activity into everyday routines doing some things to work towards a healthier body rate weight, if you're smoking butt out at any age, but it's really important. You know, it's interesting because we're talking about women. Women will do things for other people. So women who are smokers actually will stop smoking during pregnancy to protect their baby. But some women will start again to distance themselves and give them a break from the world around them. It's very an interesting psychology. And women need to take care of themselves and find healthy ways to take care of themselves. So I would suggest in our 30s, when sometimes women in society are working in the home or outside the home or both, um, juggling a lot of things, as are men, um, that we take a little time for ourselves and incorporate physical activity into our everyday routine. Uh, that is a really good time to, uh, to start these healthy habits. If you are working in your 30s or 40s or beyond 50s, 60s, 70s nowadays, I think making sure we're eating well so we can live well is important. And it's not always easy, but, and I don't have it here in front of me. I usually bring up, show, I brought my lunch bag to work today. So it took me more time. I've been doing this for years to bring my lunch to work, but making a heart healthy lunch where I know there's no hidden fats or calories or sugars that I don't want in my lunch um, with me. And aside from saving money, it actually is a healthier way to go. So I know I have fruits and vegetables. I have apple slices. I have salads. I have my bottle of water. I am eating a healthy way. And I think 
if you are someone in your 30s or your 40s and you happen to have young children in your life, be it your own children, nieces and nephews, friends, leading by example is really important. It's like when we're out on the ski hills nowadays or riding bikes, you don't expect a child to put on a helmet if you're not wearing a helmet with them. And I think the same holds true for eating well. We can lead by example. I, my philosophy in life is most things in moderation except smoking. And so, you know, I like chocolate now and then, you know, um, I, I lead a heart healthy life, but <laughs> when I used to go to restaurants, once every few months, I would like the gourmet, I like the French fries sometimes, so that's okay, but it's a balance. And I think trying to find that balance is really important. And in your 30s and 40s, I think it's the time to, to take, your, the, to take um, your actions to lead by example. By the time you're getting to your 40s and 50s and life is busy, and, and, but you're established, you may or may not have gotten into the right habits earlier on. It's still not too late to make some changes. And I think you're less inclined to join a gym when you're in your 50s if you haven't joined a gym in your 30s or 40s, but you don't have to. Going out, finding a buddy, a friend or a family member to go for walks and being accountable to someone else with you. So it's always nice. It's, it's, it's a bit of psychology, but it's buddying up. To get something done, you need to buddy it up. We all need to have a friend in life where we can do it because we can all think we want to do the best intentions, but it's easy for us to cheat on ourselves a little, right? So, so finding someone in your life or your community that you want to start walking with, right? You know, or you may have a close friend that says, you know what, this is it. I'm turning 45 or 50 or 55. And you know what, I keep saying this, but I haven't lost those five pounds. I'm making a commitment to myself and, you, and I'm gonna, you're hearing my commitment. Will you go for a walk with me? Will you, will you be in my program? So scheduling it in, because by the time you're in your 50s, you're, many of us schedule things into our routine and we'll schedule things in for others, elderly parents or younger children. And you know, scheduling into our everyday activity, time for, for exercise or activity into our calendar is really important sticking to it. So I think that's important. By the time you're into your 50s and 60s, you're actually going to start seeing friends and family members with health issues. Sometimes you're scared by it. Sometimes you're not aware of it. And by health issues, I mean, you may have a friend at work, you heard who someone had a heart attack. We may hear people who have cancer related issues and, and it becomes more our, our I think our mortality is more, um, uh, we're more aware of our mortality, um, but we're not quite there yet. And it's, it's good that we are aware that we can actually make some changes. And the reason I brought up cancer is actually very interesting. Preventive treatments in terms of lifestyle, healthy body weight, healthy eating, not smoking and physical activity helps prevent cancers as well as heart disease. So I think that when we're at midlife and beyond and then women may be seeing their body shape and size change a little, it's not too late. Don't give up. Talk to your healthcare provider, buddy up with a friend. People are juggling. We talk about the sandwich generation, older parents, younger kids, everyone's got something going on, but we need to take time for ourselves and make ourselves a priority. By the time we're a little older, um, again, we start seeing risk factors emerging for coronary heart disease in women in their 60s and 70s. And we have, and 80s and 90s, we have vibrant people out there now living with heart disease uh, or preventing heart disease is actually risk, living with risk factors for heart disease, which we want to prevent. So if you have high blood pressure, you have high cholesterol, you have diabetes, there are great treatments out there. So with the lifestyle, this is where medications are really, really, really important. And you know, there's a study in the New England Journal of Medicine published a few years ago that took men over 55 and women over 65 who had a non-traditional risk factor for heart disease. It could be a little extra weight across the belly, could be a family history. And people in that study, half of them got a fake pill or a placebo half of them got a real cholesterol, got the real deal, got a cholesterol pill, low dose cholesterol pill. And you know that the women and men who got the cholesterol pill over the seven years of their life, of the study had less heart attack, stroke, bypass surgery, scary stuff. So by the time we're already into our 50s, 60s and 70s, I think there is actually more of a role for medications with lifestyle. I don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, however. <laughs> Oh, this has been so inspiring and, um, and informative. And, um, 
I we are already at one o'clock and we have a couple of questions. Did you want to take these questions? Sure. Can you see them or do you want me to read them out to you? Um, sure. You can read you you're you're welcome to I, I only have I have like one or two questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I, it's talking about walking and if it's too cold to walk outside, you can do some heart healthy walks on YouTube. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I think there are some opportunities. There's, there's a YouTube video, which I'm not, I, 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 I'm trying to be less technical than the world expects of me because I'm trying to go back to basics. Uh, there's a Leslie Sansoni who you can do YouTube walks with, but I have to say just getting out and being active. Um, and if it's too cold to walk outside, a lot of us have stairs and I think stairs are an opportunity. My father, I'm going to say, I don't know if he's listening right now, but he is a senior citizen, sharp as a tack in an apartment building. We're making him do his stairs inside when it's cold out, okay? Because that's good for your cardiovascular health. It's also good for toning and conditioning and overall well-being as we get older. So that's important. Um, there are, are, are tons of questions we could ask. I don't know if there's some other questions. Yeah, out. we have some in the Q&A. Oh, have, I don't see um, it here. Sorry, here, so I, I can, apologize. No, I can oh, read oh, it. Oh, okay, I, I have it now. I see, you I, told okay. you. I yeah, can, yeah. I, I, I'm a heart doctor who can take care of patients, but not as good with the technology. Okay, so there's a question here, and this is a good question. Is the familiar risk higher or lower or the same if a parent had diabetes and their heart disease was a complication of the diabetes? Excellent question. If the heart disease was a, a complication of diabetes, the risk may actually be lower, but it depends. So uh, di adult onset diabetes related to being a little overweight tends to run in families. So it is important if you have a family member with diabetes and heart disease that your risk is that you try and maintain a lower risk and chance of diabetes by regular physical activity and healthy body weight. There are some actually um, increasing tests we can order. We call them biomarkers or just blood tests. Um, there's a test that is actually available widely across Canada. It's not covered everywhere in terms of costs, but the cost is not exceedingly high. There's a test called LP little a. It's something I'd have my patients and clients think about when they're talking to their doctors about cholesterol testing, because that tends to bring out some genetic testing with family members. So that's a good question. Um, so so there's another good, they're all good questions. There's a question here about what are the symptoms for men and symptoms for women? I'm supposing of a heart attack. Are there differences when it comes to ethnicity of a patient, black or white, age of the participant, young or older? I think that's really good to, question to ask because we need to be aware of that. I think our culture helps us define how we communicate. But at the end of the day, the commonest symptom for women and men of all ages all sexes and all ethnic and racial backgrounds of a heart attack is a discomfort in your chest. Now that chest discomfort, most people would call a heaviness, often associated with being short of breath or sweaty, cold and clammy. If you're having chest discomfort that is unusual and out of the blue, seek urgent medical attention, speak to a healthcare provider and say, could this be my heart? It may not be your heart, but could this be your heart? You know, I actually think we need to do more research on how we communicate. We call this qualitative research. What's the quality of how we communicate coming into the emergency room? Does it affect the care we get? Because I remember when I was a young doctor first starting out, I admitted somebody to my coronary care unit who I thought was having a heart attack, who was actually having <laughs> Was, was was having a gallbladder attack because I was getting the history through translation. There was a pain and the pain could be the heart, might not be the heart. We did various tests and we sorted it out, but it's often in the history. And so I use that example as a language barrier, someone who didn't speak my language and I was getting it through translation, that we need to see what the subtleties are with language. But if you're not feeling quite right, get it checked out and be proactive. Ask, could it be your heart? To my knowledge, I'm not aware of differences based on ethnicity. I am based or age. I am aware of the fact that some people think it couldn't be their heart based on various groups. And, and I try to say coronary heart disease is a, it's an equal opportunity killer and the face of heart disease has changed. Um, okay, and then I'm getting a question here on a new drug in Tresto. 
that helps with heart failure? Well, I think the bigger issue, and Entresto is a drug that I use in my practice often, and people who have a weakened heart muscle, um, that there is good medication out there for women and men that is evidence-based and our Canadian and American guidelines support the use of evidence-based drugs. So I think that if, you know, in this particular uh, uh, comment, I won't go into all the nitty details. This is a drug, as it, all drugs have risk and benefit. And in the individual patient, the risk is outweighed by benefit, right? So um, in, uh, the, the drug for congestive heart failure or a weakened heart muscle, the drugs have become more complicated and complex. And this drug Entresto is in our armamentarium and it is an evidence-based drug that, that is a uh, guideline recommended. So I, I think, and it's recommended for women and men. Um, other questions out there? There's more underneath. Oh, oh I'm so sorry. Man, they're coming in. They're rolling in. <laughs> okay, so I've heard that heart tests, uh, uh, stress tests aren't good for picking up cardiac issues in women. It is it true. What's a good test? Really good question. So and it's a funny statistical. It's a funny statistical fact that if I take someone who's not likely to have the disease and I give them a test. Uh, let's say an HIV test to everyone, there'll be some false negatives, okay, and false positives. We have to pick the right people for the test. In women, as in men, if you are having symptoms suggestive of coronary heart disease, a stress test is a good first test because a negative test excludes a lot of people who might have disease. But in women, it doesn't give us all the answers, actually, probably because estrogen has effects on our cardiogram, on the wiggly lines on the cardiogram I read, and has some effects that make the, the actual effects of the ECG a little different. And in fact, in an otherwise healthy younger woman, it can be their heart and it needs to be looked into, but it may not be as likely to be your heart as a 70-year-old woman or man. So a for stress test is often the first good test. Sometimes if it's abnormal, I will tell women before they get on the treadmill, don't freak out. If this is abnormal, I may have to do another test, a stress scan of the heart, such as stress echo, a stress MIBI, an additional test. Um, but it is a good first test. Um, and there's vari variation across the country as to what our first test should be. There are a lot of good tests out there. Um, um, and uh, I'm looking here about the fact that um, uh, someone had a, a friend and a family member whose, whose parent unfortunately died of a heart attack and they looked healthy. This is a really good point. They looked thin and lean and healthy. The, we don't have direct to consumer advertising in Canada. If you're listening, if you're listening in the States, you might, but there's a commercial out there for medications where there are two twins and someone trips on the red carpet because you can't tell what's on the inside. And I would actually argue that although I've talked about your shape and your size and how you look as a first step towards fitness and health, you cannot tell by looking at someone what their cholesterol level is, what their blood pressure is, what their, their blood sugar level is like, and what their family history is. So we need to do testing beyond first glance. And so um, I actually do recommend for people who are worried about a family history of heart disease to get the right testing and have the right conversation with their family doctor, whether it's cholesterol or we talk about an advanced cholesterol panel. So I mentioned that LP little a, and some people we get worried about, not covered and broadly used across the country, but well studied and validated, looking for junk in your arteries. And the easiest artery for us to examine with an ultrasound probe are actually the arteries in our neck. And if the arteries in our neck are thick or damaged, then the arteries elsewhere are, because you have to understand a heart attack is actually a disease of the arteries not just a disease of the heart. So there are all sorts of tests uh, we can do to sort out risk for heart disease. Um, okay, someone has asked the difference be, to differentiate, be, differentiate between an angina attack and a heart attack. Angina is the symptom that is, is a description of chest discomfort, we say usually coming from a blood flow problem to the heart. And if you're having a discomfort that comes on with exercise and goes away with rest or someone's nitroglycerin, that could be your heart. And if it's out of the blue, you get to the hospital. The way we sort this out 
is a little more sophisticated now. We use blood tests in the emergency room. We do other tests on the cardiogram. And that's a discussion with your doctor to sort out. But if you're having chest discomfort that's coming on with activity, you should talk to your doctor about it. Okay, stress and anxiety and its relation to heart disease and heart attack. Yes, good news is because we're all under stress this year. We're all under stress most of the time, but this has been an extraordinary time. We are living through history. Um, the good news is it is not stress that usually kills us. It's how we deal with stress. So I would tell you that if you're taking in some positive coping mechanisms during these unusual stressors, and if you're not, it's not too late to make these changes, going for a walk, trying to eat healthy. I talk about the COVID creep in my patients. You've gained five or 10 pounds. Try and lose it. Try and eat less junk food. Try and eat more healthy. That will be better for you. If under tremendous stress, you go out and gain 40 pounds and start smoking, it's how we're dealing with stress that ultimately puts us at risk for heart attack. There are some slight exceptions to the rule. Some of us who go through severe life altering stressors, like the loss of a spouse, um, there is some data suggests that that person is under tremendously increased risk of a, of a heart attack in the next while. But I think managing your stress and getting help during unusual times helps us lower risk for heart attack all around. So I'm scrolling down to look. Uh, okay, good question. Is it beneficial to take daily aspirin to prevent a heart attack and what's the risk? So my short answer is no. We aspirin, like I talked about, all medications have risk and benefit. And aspirin, if you have heart disease or at risk for heart disease uh, and are told to take aspirin, the risk is outweighed by benefits. So my patients living with heart disease and heart attack, previous heart attacks should be on aspirin. But everyone else, aspirin can cause bleeding or have problems. I tell you to take a fake pill or a placebo for a walk instead of an aspirin. That's absolutely the best way to go um, in terms of preventing heart attack. There are some medications, though, that I alluded to in the talk, such as statin drugs or certain cholesterol drugs that in the right patient, not everybody, although there's some studies out there saying that we should we should be more liberal in giving low dose statins to the population. We have some studies uh, internationally looking at that. That statins actually prevent heart attack. I'd say more so than aspirin, but we shouldn't be taking that. So I think that's, I scroll down on all the questions. Yes, um, those were great questions and great answers. Um, so I think we have a couple of things we'll tell you about another webinar, but I just want to look at our participant list here because we can pick the winner um, of a copy of your book. So we have um, 34 people still here with us. So if you want to pick a number between one and 34, Dr. Abramson. Okay, I haven't looked at the number. The other thing I will tell you is that I wrote this for charity. If someone wants to go out and buy my book, I get a one penny royalty. I, I really wrote it for my patients. It was a labor of love. <laughs> it supports the Heart and Stroke Foundation. Uh, number 18. Okay. Now I, I have to just make sure I can count. <laughs> um, but I think there's useful information uh, for people who want more information out there, I'm not trying to plug or support the book that way. I I'm kind of feel I'm embarrassed with shameless self-promotion, but I wrote it the level, I wrote it for my patients, but the level, of all, uh, some people find it uh, hopefully useful at the, at the medical level that if you had to come in the first half of the book is how I can prevent heart disease. Second half is I have heart disease. What are the issues in navigating the system uh, so that you're more educated uh, to help ask the right questions. So our winner is Jennifer Awerlo. Uh, so Jennifer, I know you can't speak, but, um, but you can send us an email um, and let us know um, your uh, mailing address and we will send that book out um, to you. Okay, we're asking, can you post the book for everybody? Oh yeah, so I can bring up the slideshow again and um, I'll just go back to that slide. Um, actually, so that everyone can see that. Yeah, I think it, I, again, uh, it supports charity. And I, I, if someone goes and buys it now, I get one penny. I'm happy to give that one penny back to charity. Um, I think it actually is available still on Amazon. Um, it's a, I wrote it a few years ago, but it's still relevant. I actually think that the main issues are, are still there. Um, and uh, there is a French version. It has been translated into French as well. I think um, you're being so modest um, about the book, and I'm sure it's very helpful. So, um, <laughs> so there's the book. If anyone wants to go and buy it, it's um yeah everywhere that you buy your books, Amazon, Indigo, and um, 
just um, we have some slides and I'll send this out with the email. So if anyone wants to just go remind themselves of some of the great information that Dr. Abramson shared today. Um, and we do have a future webinar on February the 23rd, which is in two Tuesdays from now. And it's how testing can make us safe at work. Uh, so we're accustomed to thinking of the vaccine's arrival as the ultimate COVID-19 changer, but equally important is the onset of new and more rapid testing options. Um, so we will be having this webinar and you can see the link there um, to register for it. You can access this webinar within a couple of days and we will send it out in a follow-up email. But all of our past webinars are available on YouTube at youtube.com slash medcanlivewell. So if you've missed any or you want to see the topics ranging everything to do with eat, uh, eating better, moving better, and living better. Um, and then some other things. We recently, the most recent Eat, Move, Think podcast episode was with Logan Yuri and she's written a great book called How to Not Die Alone. And uh, this one is very timely in how we can have better relationships with others, um, whether you're single or in a relationship or whether you've been married for years and years. Um, it was a really great and uh, interesting podcast episode. And that is it. So thank you so much, Dr. Abramson. This was a wonderful webinar. We really appreciate your time today. My pleasure. Be well, everyone.